Hello Internet, welcome back to our tutorial playthrough of Cataclysm Dark Days Ahead. Last episode we talked about medications and the different uh, archetypes of medication. And I think we're finally ready to head out of the base and head towards town. Before we do that, we're going to quickly craft a secondary weapon because again, we discussed the spike on a stick being flimsy, uh, which means that, where's that at? Down here. Flimsy, which means it will not last long in combat before breaking apart. And what this equates to, in my experience, is that you can usually, honestly, sometimes it's as bad as only killing two enemies before the weapon breaks. Sometimes it's, in my experience, it's around five enemies and then it's time to move on and find a different weapon. Important thing to notice about weapons as well, which I definitely should have mentioned in our weapons playthrough, is that the more damaged your weapon is, the less damage it will deal. And so as we attack with this stick and it gets it's flimsy so it breaks down quickly, once it starts taking damage, the actual damage output of the weapon will drop as well. So it's very important that we pick up a backup weapon so that we don't get into a situation where our, our spear breaks apart while we're in the middle of combat um, so we can have something in our back pocket to pick up and use uh, in a pinch. Now we did look at weapons previously. I think I had said that the cudgel looked pretty good. Um, it has lower damage than our spear but it's a better to hit and it has the rapid strike ability. It's also not flimsy. You'll see it's listed as well made which means it's less likely to take damage. So I think we'll just quickly make a cudgel as a backup weapon here. Alternatively um, we could try to make another spear, but honestly, that was a little bit of a to-do to try and secure the spike and get extra cordage and stuff. And I think it'll be easier to make better spears once we get materials after looting the town for a little bit. So we're just going to quickly make a cudgel here. And we're just going to store that in our inventory. So we're going to wield the spike on a stick and uh, keep the cudgel in our inventory. Now, the negative to this is that it takes up space in the inventory which means it's going to lower the amount of stuff we can carry back to base but i think that that is fine i'll go ahead and favorite that as well so we don't accidentally drop it anywhere other than that i think we're ready to head out we probably could do with a drink but i think i'll hold off going into town because a lot of houses so we looked at our town previously a lot of houses have water heaters and water storage in them so we probably will be able to find something to drink and um, I think we need to talk about threat assessment, which is a, a weird thing to talk about. It's a hard thing to talk about in Cataclysm. And it's really something, we're gonna exit from the south just in case there's something to our north. I will close the door behind me. That's just a habit. Uh, we're isolated enough that we don't necessarily need to close the door. Um, if our NPC sees something he wants to fight, he's just gonna break out a window or whatever. Any, I mean, he doesn't break windows but he'll pop out the window anyway. So it doesn't really matter if we close the door or not, but it's just a habit that I have. I like to close doors behind me. So, threat assessment. Um, we don't know what this town looks like. We don't have, it's really hard to talk about threat assessment in Cataclysm because it's really something that you just learn over time. So if we look at our town, which again, lowercase m to look at the map, You'll see the town is primarily, well, you, you don't know probably. These green carrots represent houses. Uh, they are the bulk of map gen. So most towns that you go to will have quite a few houses. Everything else is all the different colored carrots, all the different letters and stuff. They represent different map locations. We talked about the prison a little bit. There's no way for you as a player to know how dangerous the prison is. I, as like because you, you've never played the game before, I have played enough that I know that, one, the prison doesn't really have loot in it. Two, there are angry robots in the prison that can murder us in a shot. So we really don't want to go mess with the prison. And that there are brutes, there are cops. Those things can be very dangerous to a day one character. So we would like to give this prison as much of a wide berth as possible. But as a brand new player, you would not know that. Sometimes you can use common sense. Like you can say, okay, well, what would really be in a prison? It's a prison. Probably nothing. Maybe some hefty food stores if you found a cafeteria area, but probably nothing. Probably just a lot of zombies, right? Because a prison is a pretty densely populated building. And so you can use a little bit of application of common sense, but sometimes that's not accurate. For instance, this is the old style prison. There really isn't a lot of food there. Like you might think like, oh, it's a big, good, good. they got to feed hundreds of inmates. There's probably huge cans of food there. It's probably all kinds of really beneficial, like a giant cafeteria. That's probably 
locked off. Most of the zombies are probably locked in their cells and wouldn't be a problem. None of that is correct. It, they're they're everywhere in the prison. There's an angry robot in the prison. There are brutes, which are like big tough zombies that can knock you around in the prison. And even if you found the cafeteria, there's really nothing there. So unless you've played the game, you there's no way of knowing that. And so that's why it's so difficult to talk about threat assessment. Because if you haven't played, it, I, would, I would have to go through location by location and say, okay, this is probably pretty safe. This is not very safe. This you want to avoid at all costs. And that's tedious. I don't really want to make a video where I assess every single location in the game. There are, there are many locations in the game. Um, so we'll just cover some of the basics and we'll cover the ones that we see on the screen currently. So let's just talk about what we're seeing. We're seeing a ton of houses. That's again, all these green carrots that we see. And again, you can mount, you can um, manually move your cursor over this and it will tell you in the upper right corner what the object is. You can use either the arrow keys or the numpad to do this. So all these green carrots are houses. They're the most common map gen by far. This is a park. This is a rail station. Uh, let's just talk about houses. So houses are the single best place to go for miscellaneous gear. It's probably the place you want to go first in the game, unless you start at a high value place. Like sometimes military surplus can be very good on day one if you can get there. If you can get access to a gun shop on day one, all that's very good. Most of the time, you're just going to go to the closest house. And there's a couple reasons for this. Number one, Houses make good bases. They come with stoves that can be used as a safe container for fire, like we made the brazier in our playthrough. You can just start a fire in an oven and it's not gonna catch the rest of the house on fire. So they're really good for that because it comes with a pre-made fire location. They tend to have a lot of rooms. Some of them have basements or upstairs, which are safer places to live in than in the ground floor. They tend to have a lot of wood. They tend to be a great place for clothing, food, uh, rags, basic supplies, uh, you can find tools in houses, there's all kinds of stuff. Some of the houses have basements that have are special locations that might have guns or all kinds of really good stuff that you can find in a house. So houses are a high priority target on day one. And because we're starting the game, we have nothing. Like we started an evac shelter, which gave us a boost to a lot of, in a lot of ways. It gave us a lot of first aid kits. Um, hefty food rations, that kind of stuff. But like houses, they have everything. Uh, we're going to need tools. Well, you, you can find a lot of tools in houses. We're going to need like a nice knife for making spears probably in the future. Well, there are um, drawers in houses that contain just dozens of knives, which is pretty valuable. You can find basic clothing or even advanced clothing in houses, uh, which can really help you when you're wearing nothing but basic cotton clothing. Um, they have a lot of food in them, depending on what kind of house you bump into. You could find like a month's worth of food in, in houses. A lot of them have a lot of canned goods and all kinds of perishable food as well. Uh, there's just tons and tons of stuff you can find in houses. So houses, can't stress enough, very good on day one. Now, if we continue looking around, a park, not good for us. Um, I happen to know that somebody who, whoever made the parks... They went crazy overboard with the monster density. Every park I've come across recently has like 40 monsters in it. And there's no call for that at all. Because it doesn't fit with the other locations. Because um, most locations will have two or three zombies. The park has like 40 and it's absolutely ridiculous. I might be exaggerating. It's probably like 20. But like, it's too many. It's a freaking park. Most people died in their houses or in hospitals or whatever. Most people were not walking their dogs when they died. And so it really bothers personal pet peeve. Don't, you know, whatever. So we're going to try to give that a wide berth. We'll see if we can get eyes on it while it's daylight. But it's going to be packed probably. Railway stations, not really, there's eh, really nothing there. I think there's like a, a giant mutant creature that can spawn in the basement. That if you're looking for mutant meat, you can get. But you really should be avoiding that mostly anyway. Uh, they do have vending machines, so that's something if we have cash, we could potentially buy some junk food if we were really hurting for food. What else do we got? Clothing store, useless. Um, even though we're in the early game and we need clothing, 90% of what you find in the clothing store is is cotton clothing. So unless you're like really hurting for clothes, probably not, not worth going to. We have an arcade. Arcades spawn a lot of child zombies. 
which can be frustrating, but they're an excellent place to go if you're looking for electronic supplies because you can disassemble the machines. What else we got? Pavilion, nothing there. Electronics shop is pretty great. Um, they will have a lot of mat materials and tools that you need to work on electronics. That's something we don't need on day one, but it's something we would definitely explore at some point. Hardware store, very, very good in the early game because we can get a lot of the tools we'll need for crafting uh, and building up our character. Clothing store, again, not useful. Grocery store might sound really useful, but honestly, you can find more food in the houses right here than you would get by walking all the way up here to the, the grocery store. Only real benefit there is that they can have shopping carts, which we can use for transporting goods. Um, and that's, that's really all I'm seeing. I think the abandoned warehouse... Uh, you know, I mix up the warehouse locations. I don't know what would be there. Possibly some good stuff. Baseball field, no. Gun store, very good, but we don't have the means to get inside probably at the moment. Uh, and then we have a motel, which again is not a very good location. Never seen a smoking lounge before. Who knows what's in there. So, out of this little area, I'm actually really unimpressed by what we've found. We're mostly just going to spend our time clearing houses, which is fine. Because again, it's the most generalized source of loot. There's going to be a little bit of everything. So I think we're going to push up into town. Sorry that was so long-winded. I was just trying to make the point that assessing locations and threats is very difficult to explain to a new player. A lot of it comes with experience. And we'll just talk about locations as we get there. So we're going to proceed... And you'll see, we never talked about safe mode. Oh, so safe mode is this thing that um, it's toggled with the exclamation key. You'll see it says if it's on or off. Toggling it does not take a turn, so we can do this as many times as we want. When safe mode is on and you come across an enemy, which uh, they must have moved because we don't see them anymore. Uh, there we go. So we've spotted a zombie, and what safe mode does, my movement keys are now locked. I can't actually move my character. And you'll see it's it's just displaying this message every time I try to move. Safe mode keeps you from holding down the button and running into an enemy is mostly what it does. Um, it says, hey, you spotted a zombie and we have safe mode on. So we're going to lock your movement keys until you either turn off safe mode or ignore the enemy. So we can look around and try to spot this enemy. We could do this manually using X to try and look around. Most likely it's in the town here. Yeah, we spotted it. Alternatively, we can hit Shift V, which will uh, toggle either item display or monster display. You do this by pressing Tab to shift from items or monsters. So if you're on the items menu, it will list all items that you can see. Oh, there's a corpse over there. What a uh, build? Oh, it's the prison, of course. Um, and if we hit Tab, it'll take us to the monsters, and it will display any monsters we can currently see. And then it will also. This menu is pretty great because it tells you where. They are. So he's 60 tiles to our north. That's pretty far away. He has not spotted us, even though we've spotted him. Excuse me, my phone is ringing. I love when my phone rings twice and interrupts my video, but then stops ringing because the telemarketer decided I wasn't worth their time. Very exciting. Um, so this person, this zombie, has not seen us, but we have seen him. If he had seen us, there would be an exclamation point here somewhere. I think before it will show an exclamation point indicating that he has spotted us. So he's far enough away that we could move without it. If we wanted to, we could just turn off safe mode, but this would prevent it from toggling, uh, stopping us in the future. So if we, you know, continued walking up this way and a zombie came out of the forest, it would not prompt us for, hey, we spotted this zombie. Alternatively, if we turn safe mode on and we move and we spot it, what we can do is ignore this enemy if we press the apostrophe key so this or single quote key, which is uh, occupies the same key as the double quote. Uh, it will ignore that particular enemy that it's giving you the alert for. What this means is that I can now move, as even though I can see the zombie, I can continue moving until another enemy pops up. And used to be really finicky if you ignored enemies and you took a few steps it would stop you for the exact same enemy. Here it actually stopped us because we've seen a secondary enemy. So let's do the same thing here and shift V. Oh, is pretty concerning. Once again, difficult to talk about threat assessment in Cataclysm. If you don't know the different creatures, most, okay. So there was a change a while ago in Cataclysm 
and uh, used to be that you could run into basically any enemy in the whole game on day one. And what this meant was that you could walk out of the evac shelter, get laser targeted by a tank, and get exploded and take 2,000 damage and, and die and be pretty miserable and unhappy. Mostly, that has been changed. Cataclysm now, in the early game, you will only encounter low-tier zombies. That doesn't mean you can't die, because God knows I have, and God knows I see people on Discord all the time who can't get past day two or day three in the game. You definitely can still die, but most of the enemies you find on day one are going to be killable. It's going to be something that, in a one-on-one -on -one fight, if you have a weapon in your hands, you will probably beat them like 99% of the time. The problem is when they gang up on you. And so by looking at these zombies, I know that standard zombies move about the same speed as the player. They're actually slower than the player is. Feral runners are faster than the player uh, if we're just walking. So feral runners can, they're, they're, exact, they're runners, they run. Uh, and they can catch up to you very quickly and, if they, and they tend to spawn in groups. So if you find groups of them and you run out of stamina or you can't run away, they will quickly surround you and cause you a lot of problems. So looking at this group, it's not that they're particularly dangerous. We can probably bait one or two of these at a time and kill them all. But because there's a group of them, it, it, it definitely warrants caution. And so I would say if you are walking along and you spot three enemies, you need to be real careful. We're approaching this town during the daylight, which is something I generally would not recommend for a new player. I just wanted to show you what the town looks like and what the monster density would look like in the daylight where we can see everything. Most of the time, the general advice that people give new players is to only raid at night. So during the day, we can obviously see those creatures that are way, way up there. And it gives us a lot of time to decide how to deal with that. They can't see us currently, but during the day, zombies also see much further. So during the day, both the player and the zombies can see a, a great distance. At night, the player can only see three or four tiles. Most zombies can only see three or four tiles. There are exceptions to this. There are zombies who are pretty blind during the daylight, and there are zombies who see very, very well at nighttime. But for the most part, that's, that's how it goes. So we're safe at a safe distance at the moment, but if we moved within 20 or 30 tiles of those creatures, they will start to spot us. So I'm going to turn off safe mode. Recommend that you keep it on and you just ignore things. That way you're much more aware of what's happening around you. Northwest, you hear bang. Again, this is the turrets and or um, robots inside of the prison shooting zombies. So we don't need to worry about that. I am very nervous that it's nearby because it will spawn a lot of enemies. But... For now, we're just going to continue pressing up into town, and we're starting to see more monster density, I believe. Nope. Uh, yeah, there's a couple more. We now see four zombies, and you'll see we're getting closer to them, so we need to be a little bit more cautious, a little bit more aware of our movement. But for now, we're fine. And you know what? We're going to ignore them, and we're just going to go over here to this house and see about getting inside the house. Now, we still see a zombie. That's okay. As we head closer to the prison, we may be exposed to more zombies. So what we're going to do, we're going to peek around corners. Uh, we've never talked about this. If you hit Shift X, it will bring up, it will say peek where, and we can step outside. Uh, it will let us move in a direction. And what that means is that we see from this tile everything we would see from standing here, but we're not actually standing here. So if we hit Escape... It moves us back. We were never actually in this tile. We were just peeking in that tile. So when we peek, we can get eyes around a corner and know if there's something over there. And what I see over here is actually a zombie corpse. It died on the barbed wire. It looks like a feral runner. In fact, we're seeing quite a few corpses. And what I think is happening... Zombie. What are you? Zombie. Feral runner. And then we saw a feral runner over here as well. And what I think is happening is that there is a robot inside the prison that is shooting its gun. And when it fires its gun, it produces noise. And that noise is drawing enemies from the town over here towards... Because they're going... They're set, in fact, we can see that happening right here. There are two enemies that were in the town. I bet these were the feral runners we spotted over here earlier. 
and they heard the gunshots, so they've meandered over here and they're trying to get into where the gunshots were. And when they do that, they're on these barbed wires, which is dealing damage to them when they move through the barbed wire. And so it has already killed a few of the enemies. And this is good for us, for the most part, because this means that it will help clear out some of the monster density without us having to do the work. We're at 21 minutes. We haven't talked about zombie reviv... Rev re we haven't talked about zombie reviv... Oh my god. Uh, so we haven't talked about zombies reviving over time. Um, it's... It's a core game mechanic. It should be its own episode. Uh, it's fine. So when a zombie dies in Cataclysm, uh, they're not actually dead for good. Uh, over time, they will revive again and stand back up. So this zombie, over time, will get back up. Even though it's dead, um, it will be revived. And we can tell it will be revived in this particular tile set because there's this little red skull indicator. And what that means is that this corpse has not been pulped or di dismembered or anything. And so as long as the body is intact, this skull will show up and the zombie will stand back up. We can prevent this by smashing their corpses or dismembering their corpses. So when you see a bunch of dead zombies like this, it's usually really beneficial to try and creep up and smash them so that you don't have to deal with them later because we have no idea, did these zombies die five minutes ago or did they die three hours ago and they're about to stand back up? So it's usually beneficial in a situation like this to push up and try to pulp them. The problem is, the gunshots are still drawing enemies. So if we press up, these feral runners will not only come down to fight us once they get eyes on us, but will also be exposed to anything else that's migrating from the city over here. So what I think we'll do is take a peek back on the main road. And we're not really seeing anything. So I think we are going to press up. And we'll peek again. Just in hopes maybe they backtracked and died. Yeah, there's four of them now, so I don't really feel comfortable going up there. What we can do is when we fight them, in fact, when we peeked, if we look here, you'll see this guy is a red exclamation indicator. And what that means is that he can see us. Now, because we're peeking, he can't actually see us, but it lets us know if we move into this tile, this zombie is going to see us. So I think we'll do is step out and look at him uh no look at him no don't peek i would like to look at him so he should have spotted us in fact you'll see he turned his body in this direction and what's probably going to happen is he's going to come down here to fight us and hopefully he'll die on the barbed wire so we'll just wait a few turns and see what happens he is coming down here and this is good oh no struggles to its feet stands on its feet so it looks like no, it just fell down. That message is very similar to the message where they actually um, get back up and revive. So you'll see he crossed through the barbed wire. It's unclear to me if he took damage. If we hover over him, you'll see it says it's moderately injured. Um, you know what? And we're going to put a cut in here because we're going to talk about melee attacking and uh, how we attack in Cataclysm. And that should really be probably its own episode. So I probably should make a full description of zombie reviving as well but uh, we'll talk about melee combat in the next episode so for now that's going to do it thank you for watching hopefully you enjoyed the series i'll be back with more of cataclysm's tutorial in the near future uh and uh thanks for thanks for being here i'll see you next time